Paul is leaving Athens where the philosophers are. He's going to Corinth, a much, much larger city, and a city of great commerce, and a city that also had pride, maybe, maybe not intellectual pride and philosophical pride like the Corinthians, but a city which had another kind of pride. I want to say something before we leave Athens about preaching and about the Sermon on Mars Hill in Acts 17 and about our approach to apologetics and what we talk about when we talk to unbelievers. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul says this, the Jews ask for signs and the Greeks search for wisdom. When we studied John chapter 1, we saw that Christ gives both. What do the Jews want to know? They want to know that that God cares. They want an intervention. They want a sign from heaven. They want God to do something. What do the Gentiles want? They want wisdom. They want God to explain something. The Greeks want the world to be interpreted for them. They want to know what it means. The Jews want God to intervene in the world. They want to know that that the world matters. Christ does both. In the beginning of John 1, John presents Christ as the Logos, the explanation, God's interpretation of the world. In the second half of John 1, John presents Jesus as the Lamb, God's intervention in the world. God proving that the world matters. God explains what the world means through Jesus. God proves that the world matters through Jesus. God explains what the world means through the life and teaching of Jesus. God proves that the world matters through the death and resurrection of Jesus. Christ is the answer to the philosophers who want wisdom. Christ is the answer to the Jews who want a sign. Everybody wants something different. But the only food that our souls can feed on is provided by the body and blood of the Savior, Jesus of Nazareth. My position is that Paul got it right in Athens. But you don't overthrow 500 years of Greek philosophy and culture and false religion in one sermon. But he made a great beginning, and some there believed namely this man called Dionysius, and this woman called Demerus, and there were also others. We think about Acts 16, we think about the planting of the church in Europe, the conversion of Lydia and the Philippian jailer. We think of the great evangelistic truth of Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in your entire household. We think of Acts 16, we think of the ministry in Greece, we think of the great sermon on Mars Hill in Athens as one of the great uh, uh, um, expression of apologetics which comes down to us from the first century. And also there is also a great evangelistic appeal, Acts 17.30, God has required that all men everywhere repent. Two radically different situations. Paul is preaching from a prison to the jailer. Paul is preaching from the Areopagus, Mars Hill, to philosophers. The message is the same. The answer is the same. The jailer, the poor jailer needs a savior. The poor philosophers who don't know that they're poor, they need a savior too. Christ came to save the jailers of the world and Christ came to save the philosophers of the world. He's the only Savior that the world has been offered. He's the only one who can save men and women of vastly different intellectual equipment, of vastly different economic standing, of vastly different rank. And that's what we see unfolding in the book of Acts. From Athens, he goes to Corinth and he meets a couple who've been thrown out of Rome by a decree of the Roman emperor Claudius. 
the Roman Emperor Suetonius mentions a furor that was created by the Jews because of someone called Crustus, probably Christ misspelled by the Latin historian Suetonius. Because of this great furor, um, Claudius solves the problem by throwing all the Jews out of Rome. And there was this Jewish couple from Pontus in Asia Minor who had moved to Rome who were now living in Corinth called Priscilla and Aquila. And when Paul gets to Corinth, uh, he makes friends with this couple and he stays with them because they're tent makers. They have the same trade. So when you look at Acts 18, verse 3, we discover the fact that Paul was not just a missionary who was supported by free will offerings, but he also worked with his hands to make money that he made tents. Now, you probably know that this phrase, tent making, has come to be used by Christians as a way to designate a missionary who supports himself with a secular job. Why is that necessary? Well, sometimes it's necessary because you can't raise enough money to be a missionary without a job. So you've got to get a job to pay your bills. And that means that you get to do pure missions that much less time that you have to devote to your job. But there's another there's another reason to do it. One reason to do it is because you can't get into certain countries as a missionary. You can't go to India as a missionary. You can't go to China as a missionary. You can't go to Saudi Arabia or Iran as a missionary. They won't give you a visa. But you might be able to go there as an, as an engineer. You might be able to go there as an English teacher. You might be able to go there as a construction worker or somebody who works for an international bank. Well, if you go there with Christian motives and if you go there with a missionary purpose, you call that bank job or that construction job or that teaching job tent making. That's what you do to support yourself or that's what you do to get into the country so that you can preach the gospel so that you can tell people about Christ. Paul also gave another reason that he worked with his hands because he didn't want to be a burden on the churches. Also, there were people who challenged his authority. There were people who challenged whether he was a real apostle or not or whether he was really teaching the right thing or not. And if he lived off the support of other people, that just gave his enemies another argument. It just gave them something else to accuse him about. So that if he, if he supported himself, then his motives could not be questioned. He couldn't be accused of doing it just for money. Um, I remember in Moscow, when I moved there, a Jewish woman who was the mother of a believer, uh, she said that the only reason that these young people were becoming Christians is that they wanted to go to America. I said, well, I lived in America and I left America. Why do you think I left America? She said, for money. So you see, this is the way the world explains the motives of Christians. So Paul did not want to be a victim of that kind of accusation, and I think that's, a, that's another reason that he made tents. Okay, so he goes into the synagogue in Corinth and he tries to persuade Jews and Gentiles. That's everybody. There are only two kinds of people, Jews and Gentiles. A Gentile is somebody who's not a Jew. A Jew is somebody who is a Jew. Those are the only two kinds of people in the world, Jews and Gentiles. So he tried to persuade everybody that Jesus was the Christ. Now, it says that when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the Word. What does that mean? It means he wasn't making tents after, Paul and, after Silas and Timothy arrived. 
What does that mean? It means that they probably brought a gift to him that he could live on so that he wouldn't have to make tents, so that he could be in full-time ministry during that season of his life. But those whom he was preaching to among the Jews, they resisted. And they not only resisted, but they blasphemed. They said things about Jesus which constitute blasphemy. So for the second time in the book of Acts, Paul says, I'm going to concentrate on the Gentiles. If you look back at Acts 13, when Paul is in Pisidian Antioch, you notice... Um, they, they say the same thing. We're going we're gonna to leave here and we're going to concentrate on the Gentiles. They actually shake the dust off their feet in, in the city of Iconium in Asia Minor. Um, and, and also Acts, Acts 13.46, Paul and Barnabas say, we are turning to the Gentiles. We need to think about this for just a minute. One of the great arguments against Christianity, it's an argument that has to be answered by very thoughtful Christian apologetics. One of the great arguments against Christianity is the unbelief of Israel. And think a minute about the logic of the argument. Okay. Does the Bible teach that the Jews are God's chosen people? Well, yes. The Christians admit that? Well, yes, we do. But the Jews did not choose Christ, did they? Well, no. And you believe that Christ is God's Son, don't you? Yes. So you believe that in rejecting Christ, the Jews have rejected God, don't you? Yes, we do believe that. How can that be possible? How can the Jews be the chosen people if they did not choose the God who chose them? That doesn't make sense. Well, that's a good argument. That's an argument. I won't say it's a good argument, but it is an understandable argument. Let me put it that way. It, it carries with it a certain logic, and it brings to us a challenge which we must answer. We answer it this way. The unbelief of Israel is prophesied in the Old Testament. You cannot read a passage like Isaiah 53 without seeing that the one who dies for sins, the one upon whom our iniquity is laid upon, will be someone who's rejected, will be someone who's not believed. This is very, very clear from many passages in Scripture. As a matter of fact, if you read Zechariah 12.10, where the second coming of Christ is prophesied, you will see that the Jews will come to a time where they mourn and they feel sorry and they lament that they pierced the Son of God. And in piercing the Son of God, they pierced God Himself. That's Zechariah 12.10. All three persons of the Trinity are mentioned in Zechariah 12.10. The crucifixion is mentioned in Zechariah 12.10. The mistake and error and rejection of the Jews is mentioned. All of that is mentioned in one verse. One verse in the Old Testament. Zechariah 12.10. So, the rejection of Christ is actually prophesied in the Old Testament. The crucifixion of Christ is prophesied in the Old Testament. You have to realize that the children of Israel wanted to stone Moses in the wilderness. You have to realize that even the, the people who are supposed to be loyal to David wanted to stone David at a place called Ziklag in 1 Samuel chapter 30. You have to realize that the righteous prophets had to hide. Elijah had to hide. The prophets whom God sent to Israel were not popular. They were not accepted. They were not hailed and, and treated well. And so 
it's no great surprise that this pattern continues. But we also, and Christians disagree on this, some Christians believe that there is no future for Israel, that all the promises of Israel have been rolled into the church. As a matter of fact, most of the great scholars believe that. I believe that there will be a future for Israel. I believe that the Jewish people will come to believe in the Messiah. As a matter of fact, I believe that's one thing that Zechariah 12.10 talks about. It's amazing how much there is in that one verse. So history isn't over yet. And I believe a time will come, and I think Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 11, that a time will come when the Jews will turn to Christ. Um, but now we're in this in-between time where among the most resistant people in the world to the gospel are the very Jews, the chosen people, whom God has shown so much favor to. Paul writes that not everybody who is called Israel is really Israel. That Abraham had sons who were not going to be heirs to the promises. And that the promises bring us benefit only through Christ, not just by being a Jew, but you have to trust Christ and not just trust in the fleshly birth of, of being racially designated a Jew. But, and we also have to remember that there were great Jews who trusted Christ. We're studying one of them right now. His name is Paul. But he becomes so frustrated with Jewish evangelism that he says for the second time, the first time in Iconium in Acts 13, now the second time in Corinth in Acts 18, I'm not going to pay much attention to the Jews anymore. I'm going to concentrate on the Gentiles. Now, I've got to say one more thing about missions before we leave that thing. Some missionaries work in a harvest. That is, they work in places where, where people are responsive to the gospel. Some missionaries break up stony ground. That is, they work in places where people are very unresponsive to the gospel. South Korea is a harvest. It's a place where people have been very, very, very responsive to the gospel. Most South Korean churches have a prayer meeting at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning every day. Not once a week, every day. Not at 7 o'clock at night, but 5 o'clock in the morning. Not on Wednesday, every day. And they're very well attended. The largest church in the world is in South Korea. The largest Baptist church in the world is in South Korea. The largest Methodist church in the world is in South Korea. The largest Presbyterian church in the world is in South Korea. It's amazing. Japan is very unresponsive. Japan is stony ground. China is somewhere in the middle. I think Paul got to the point where he said, you know, I don't think I'm going to break up stony ground anymore. I think I'm going to concentrate on the harvest. I don't think it's wrong to spend time laboring in places which are not responsive. I think sometimes God leads Christians to witness in a place that's not fruitful. The fruit may come after your lifetime. The fruit may come after you're buried. The fruit may come after you leave. You know, one reason Korea has been so responsive is because there were faithful Presbyterian missionaries there working during times when it was not so responsive. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. Paul believes that his chief emphasis from, emphasis from here on out is not to be with the Jews, but the Gentiles. And he says that in Acts 18.6. And he goes from the synagogue to stay in somebody's house named Titius Justus, whose house was next to the synagogue. So Acts 18.7 
marks a great contrast. Um, now he's going to minister in a house, and evidently it's the house of a Gentile. It says that Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that the Jews aren't completely given up on. Paul says, I'm not going to concentrate on the Jews anymore, but that's at verse 6. But verse 8 says that the leader of the synagogue got saved with his whole family. They believed and were baptized. Now look at verse 9 and verse 10. Jesus appears to Paul and he encourages him. Paul is very discouraged in verse 6. He says, I'm tired of this opposition. I'm going to concentrate on the Gentiles. The Lord appears to him and he says in verse 10, I am with you. No one's going to hurt you. And then he says, and this is very, very amazing, he says, I have many people in this city. What did that mean? Well, honestly, we think it has something to do with the doctrine of election this scary, scary doctrine that causes everybody to be upset and to fight about, this scary thing called predestination. We have to remind ourselves that predestination was not a wild idea invented by John Calvin. That election and predestination are actually words that we find in the Bible. And probably what Jesus meant was when He said, I have many people in this city. Probably what he meant was there are a lot of people here who are not saved yet, but they're mine. They are going to be saved, and they are going to belong to me. And see, this is a great encouragement. We go to places, we preach the gospel, where we know that God has already determined to save certain people. How do we find out who those people are? We preach the gospel to them. And those who repent and respond are those whom God has marked out as His own. What a way to encourage Paul. Jesus says about this terrible pagan city, I have many people in this city. There was a proconsul. Uh, a Roman representative, of a kind of judge in that region of Greece called uh, Gallio, and the Jews urged Gallio to, per to prosecute the Christians, to do something about the Christian activity in Corinth. And beginning in Acts 18.12, we see that Gallio essentially says this is a quarrel about Jewish religious law. It's got nothing to do with Rome. I don't want to talk about it. But they did take the leader of the, of the synagogue, Sosthenes, and they beat him up. Gallio did nothing about it. Paul actually stayed a year and a half in Corinth. It was his longest sustained ministry in any place. We see that in verse 11. He settled there a year and six months, teaching the Word of God to them. But then he leaves. And he leaves Europe, and he goes uh, to Ephesus. Um, they ask him to stay, but he can't, or he won't. He says, I'll come back if it's God's will. In verse 22, he returns to Antioch, which is the place where he started. And so that's the end of the second missionary journey. Second missionary journey begins at the end of chapter 15, the beginning of chapter 16, and it ends in Acts 18.22. And immediately, the third missionary journey begins. At least it begins according to Luke's narrative. It says, having spent some time there, we don't know exactly how long, he, he departs. He leaves again. He spends some time in Antioch reporting back to the church. Then he leaves again, and he goes back to Asia Minor, which is a place where he spent the entire first missionary journey, the first part of the second missionary journey, and it's the place where he ended up on the second missionary journey. He goes back to Asia Minor.
Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300. Or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.